All right, everybody, uh, thank you for coming to Decoding Recaptcha. I'm Jason Lee, and this is Chad Houck. Uh, we're programmers and entrepreneurs from Michigan who have a passion for security and automation. We're business partners, and we've worked together on numerous projects throughout the years. Our company, Ziggy, provides information technology related consulting and contracting work for other businesses. I want to talk about the, mic. the system, which we are explaining today, has been created to decode recaptcha with absolutely no human intervention. Chad's developed a system. Yeah, you gotta talk on the mic. Oh, <laughs> Chad's developed a system to effectively solve recapture images, and uh, he's developed new methods of analysis and software in order to bypass security measures used by them in both the past and the present. Virtually the entire development process took place in Chad's garage, and I was involved throughout a majority of it as a person worthy of him to impress and bounce ideas back and forth with. Throughout this time, I've come to understand quite a bit about both captures and the methods utilized to bypass them. We're here to talk today about uh, identifying weaknesses in capture security and more importantly, the methods in which Google's spam protection service. Yes, we are. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> We're here to talk about identifying uh, weakness in capture security and more importantly, the methods in which Google's spam protection service. Recapture can be guessed accurately enough to be considered an effective defeat of their security. I will go into some detail about why Recapture was chosen to crack, and uh, I'm just going to move on. Over 30 million Recapture images are typed in every day in order to prove that the request was issued by a human and not a robot. It has often been regarded as one of the most secure captures available to third-party web developers as a form of spam protection. It is considered, it is currently used on many of the Internet's most popular websites as their primary defense against automation and abuse of their services. This capture is a common site for those registering or interacting with sites such as Craigslist, Facebook, Twitter, and countless other web pages. The reason that websites are forced to use such measures is due to the prominence of Internet spam and the ease in which programmers would be able to automate and abuse services on a large scale without some sort of verification. For example, a large scaled system such as a botnet would be easily capable of causing havoc on websites such as Facebook through the creation of fake profiles and messages without protection such as an effective capture guarding it. It is also one of the many protections that Craigslist implements in order to fend off potential abusers from posting numerous times on their system with automated software. Such measures are necessary in order to keep the ratio of legitimate use to illegitimate use down and provide a high level of user satisfaction. There's a variety of ways in which captures can be bypassed ranging from human data entry services to autonomous software that's able to bypass the distortion and manipulations present in these images and give a correct answer. Uh, an automated system that could only achieve in a very small percentage of correct answers would be considered a viable method of circumventing a CAPTCHA. Human-powered CAPTCHA data entry services are utilized in order to circumvent what are considered to be strong CAPTCHAs. There, are, there is an advantage to this type of data entry service as they are able to accurately solve any CAPTCHA that is readable by humans. There are many drawbacks to this form of capture circumvention, however. First and foremost drawback is its cost. We experimented with human, human capture entry services in order to name our capture images and to experiment with training techniques. And the cheapest pricing we found was about a fifth of a cent per correct image. There are capture entry services that utilize incredibly cheap labor in impoverished countries where a couple of American dollars a day that a housewife with no work experience can earn, and it can be a major asset to their family. While there is a willing workforce available, the additional cost and convenience of managing a workforce is frequently enough to make the price of a spammer's campaign too high. A second strong drawback to the human capture entry is the response time. In our testing, we would experience response times that are best 15 seconds and more commonly would exceed two minutes. Despite the large amount of people willing to do these types of services, they are still limited by their access to computers and internet connections. Often these types of data entry farms can become completely inaccessible due to the poor connectivity, and this poor connectivity also plays a role as many of these data entry workers may be on dial up and experience long load times due to the high level of image transfers required. Given that there is a cost per image and a limited pool of workers available at any given time causes long wait times and due to the high demand of services by spammers and severely reduces the ability for these services to be used in a way that severely threatens the ratio of illegitimate to legitimate use of services online. And autonomous CAPTCHA solving systems are a far greater threat to the balance of spam and legitimate use on the internet than any other CAPTCHA bypassing system. The primary advantage of any computer powered CAPTCHA cracking system is the ability for it to be scaled out to any number of computers and therefore give a potential attacker virtually unlimited CAPTCHA solving capabilities. 
through the, through the utilization of botnets as resources for both proxies and processing capabilities, a lone individual could be responsible for causing a significant increase in the amount of illegitimate use on the internet. Such systems could be, be used to essentially devastate the usability of many web services by filling it with illegitimate activity and or fake users. In terms of modern cap captures, recapture is often regarded as one providing a high level of usability and protection. Broken down to specifically what we look for when we're classifying a capture's level of security. <clears throat> Following is this breakdown of potential areas of weakness in a capture system and resembles the questions one must answer in order to determine the effectiveness of a capture, be it through blatant security mistakes or through the ability of an attacker to programmatically make a successful guess on the system. And uh, one should always first consider the actual implementation security policies in developing a capture-based security system. If one wished to discover a weakness in a capture system, the easiest place to look first would be at how the system itself works. And uh, first, uh, are there a limited number of total possible challenge images? If the system uses a fixed number of images, an attacker could potentially solve every possible image and then compare hashes of solved images to challenge images. Are there a limited potential are there a limited number of potential answers? By limiting the total amount of possible answers, an attacker could greatly improve their system's effectiveness. Does the CAPTCHA implementation contain insecure encoding? Uh, could the cap correct response be derived from the image, name, form, challenge data, or a cookie? And then does the system utilize poor authentication session constraints? In a system that does not constrain CAPTCHA authentication challenges to a single use user instance of a session could be vulnerable to having the same challenge request reused. Presuming that there are no blatant implementation weaknesses able to be exploited, the next logical step would be to attempt to solve the CAPTCHA itself by autonomously classifying each image. In the following slides, I will present a majority of the questions one may ask about a CAPTCHA in order to determine exactly which barriers must be overcome in order to make a successful guess by OCR. And then on the next slides, I'll have a couple of example CAPTCHA images talking about each, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about, and I have a little scale here. And the higher the amount of yellow stars, the more security do that specific type of protection. Does the image use static fonts? A capture that uses static fonts can be defeated by off-the-shelf OCR technology such as Tesseract, OCRAT, or GOCR. If there are multiple fonts, then every font would require its own data set and one would have to develop a method of font detection for each individual one, making it a lot harder. Are the characters separated from each other? If it's easy for each character to be separated from the other characters, it allows for software to easily know at which points of the image relevant data is located. If there is noise in the capture, is it static? If the noise in an image never changes, it would be simple to remove that noise in all images. If there is noise in the capture, can it be removed? If the image noise is created in a way that it can be programmatically detected and removed, then it becomes effectively worthless as a security measure. Are the characters or words rotated? If the text is not rotated, then it will not require any further modification. Ideal character alignment will greatly increase the effectiveness of an OCR program to classify each character and word. How deformed is the text? If the text is not too deformed, it will not always be solvable by a human. If the text is not properly deformed, it will require little effort to pass through an off-the-shelf OCR program, though. Is there a lack of variation in font color? If the text is always the same color, it makes it easily possible to remove all the other colors and leave only the most important data. Can the text easily be extracted from the background? If the background is easily distinguishable from the text, it may be removed, leaving only the character data to analyze. If image distortions are present, can they be reversed? Image and text distortions are typically utilized in capture systems in order to defeat off-the-shelf OCR technology. If these distortions are able to be reversed, however, it can leave a capture vulnerable to attack. Analysis of these areas for recapture security so shows us both their primary strengths and their weaknesses. The implementation of serving up challenge images and authentication itself appears to be fairly secure. There is, however, one unavoidable weakness in the implementation that becomes evident, and that's that despite a virtually unlimited number of images, there is a fairly limited number of possible responses since they're all from the English language. And uh, now these are the, I'm going to, now with this, I've isolated each of their uh, methods they use to prevent autonomous solving by OCR, and that's through a large variety of fonts. The characters are dilated and therefore are hard to separate. There's added image noise from the inverted blob. Characters are frequently out of alignment. There's natural deformation of text since it's uh, all characters that couldn't be easily read by an OCR in the first place. And then the ribboning distortion of the entire image. Now I'm going to turn over to Chad so he can explain exactly how to bypass each one. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see here. 
Okay, so what the hell is this? You guys should be familiar with, with reCAPTCHA. If not, you might want to visit another track and also start using the internet because it's about 90% of the CAPTCHA systems out there use it. Um, what I'm going to go over is the reCAPTCHA background, which Jason already covered most of, but the distortion removal, character segmentation and recognition, <clears throat> uh, the dictionary attack that I used on it, and then my experimental results, and then as a last minute addendum, I uh, added how to decode the new reCAPTCHA because a week before the presentation they decided to change it. I'm not sure if they saw the schedule or not, but we'll see. And then I'll go over some sample decodings at the end. Um, reCAPTCHA was developed at Carnegie Mellon University. It was acquired by Google on September 16th. They saw about 30 million captures a day, utilized by almost every site now. Um, it's used for, to digitize books, and it's an OCR supplementation via dual capture request. And what I mean by that is they uh, always send out two words. One of the words is the digitization word, and the other is a verification word. Um, they assume that if you get the verification word correct, which lets you pass through to the next page, they assume that you also got the digitization word correct, which means they go back and digitize a book with that word. And they use a called word point system, and that means that um, if an OCR gets the word correct, it gives them a half point. If a person types in the word, then it's a full point, and once it reaches two and a half points, it uh, assumes that the word has been solved. Um, some things you need to be aware of, you can only solve one of the, you only need to solve one of the two words, and it's randomly placed, so you really, like you can tell about half the time which word is the verification word just you know from experience, but it is randomly located, so not all the time. Um, you can forget one of the characters and replace it with a character entirely um, differently if you want to, and it'll still be solved. Um, you need to keep a consistent 50% solution rate, otherwise you'll get flagged after about 32 times, and you'll have to solve both words perfectly. You cannot misplace a single character, you have to solve them both. And obvious solutions to that would be using a dynamic IP solution, so that way you can just switch IPs whenever you hit that rate. Um, the distortions on the, on the reCAPTCHA, there's a few nuisances to take care of. They got the blob of inversion, or at least that's what I call it. You can see the black circle there that's inverting some of the characters, characters in the word. Um, then there's some leftover artifacts you'll need to take care of sometimes. Um, there's the vertical ribboning, which is kind of annoying. Then you got character dilation, which makes it so you can't segment the characters easily. Um, then there's natural distortions and old distortions, and I'm only going to really touch the first three. Um, so first thing is to segment the two words, so that way you, know, you can separate them and work on them individually. That's extremely straightforward, you know, and there's a huge gap in between it, so just do some vertical line tests and you can find out you know, where the words separate at. And then I, to make everything easier, I turn a monochrome down to one bit, and I did this by just, for every one white pixel with a value of zero to 50, I set it white, otherwise black. You lose some information in doing this because there's some um, anti-aliasing in the image and that goes away. But anyway, on to the blob. The blob's painful, but it's quite simple in retrospect. You just need to set aside a temporary copy of the images. And then the um, simplest way to defeat any uh, form of random inversion is to just outline the image. Um, but I only use this to gather information. Then I pixelate the images, and I just do this so that way the next step is uh, more efficient because the algorithm's ON cubed, which could be uh, pretty intense if you don't pixelate it. Um, then I use an ellipse detection algorithm, which I didn't write. That's the only thing in here I didn't come up with on my own, so I talk about that later. Um, and then I went with the uh, discovered ellipse parameters. You reinvert the blob, and then you clean up leftover artifacts if there are any. Now, to outline it, it's really simple. You just uh, check every pic uh, black pixel for any surrounding white pixel. If it has a surrounding white pixel, then you mark that pixel white on a blank image, otherwise you leave it black. And the end result you see here is a perfectly outlined image and the inversion's gone, but you're just left up with some somewhat ellipses. It kind of looks like an ellipse anyway. Now I just pixelate the image to make the next algorithm more efficient. Um, you decide on a radius, for this I use two. And then for each white pixel, count every white pixel that falls within the circumference of the circle of the radius and call this K. On a new blank image, make pixels um, white that have the largest K first and on down as long as they don't come within two pixels of an already white pixel. Uh, this ensures that uh, the largest pixel groupings get priority and it's not biased. Um, the ellipse detection algorithm is pretty intense and I didn't write it, so you can either go online and learn about it. It's created by ZNG from back in 2002. Um, I'll just run through it real fast. Um, okay, so now that an image is pixelated, you can run this algorithm without it taking 30 seconds. 
the following algorithm compares every white pixel to every other white pixel. We'll call that first xi and the white pixel compared to xj. We calculate the distance between xi and xj divided by 2, stored in a. If a is less than a predetermined ellipse minimum, we'll say 30, that's what I used in this project anyway, 